Hello, hello. Oh God, am I nervous? Um, okay, having a virtual event is even more nerve-wracking than having a real-time event. So I'm super happy to be with, here with you today at London Calling, the virtual London Calling. It's a pity we can't meet in person. I'm happy the virtual uh, the London Calling team made this a virtual event and puts in the time and effort to allow all of us to share and to receive all the great content we prepared. I'm looking forward to see all other people's presentations um, and to go on Twitter afterwards and discuss the content. I'm gonna be talking about platform events today. And this talk has been in the making for two years now. This topic is very close to my heart and it was actually the first topic I ever submitted to one of the dreaming events. And over the last two years, I submitted it to six different events. And London Calling is the first one to accept it. London Calling 2020. And thank you very much for accepting this topic. And this already brings me to the core. Platform events has been around for quite a long time now, for a couple of years, and most of us know about it. Many have done the trailhead. I think many of us understand how they work and event-driven architecture is something, it's not new. It's not even, it's something really kind of old in the software industry at a whole. And in the Salesforce world, we had the streaming API for a long time, which is very similar to event-driven architecture. We have platform events now since two years. We have changed data capture GA since a long time. And nobody's using it. <laughs> Maybe not nobody, but it's still a niche product. Usually when I hear about platform events, people talk about integrations between Salesforce and other systems and having um, Kafka in between and words I don't understand. No, from my point of view, platform events, it's way simpler. It can be used within the Salesforce platform to speed up your system, to make Salesforce faster. And I think this is one of the ways I want to change the Salesforce Ohana, the Salesforce community. Find a tangible advantage of using platform events, and that's speed. Which speed? Speed for the user. I will talk about that in more detail later. Speed, how fast Salesforce feels, how snappy Salesforce feels. So I want to talk about platform events and especially um, implications on speed, on user experience, on, on user performance, uh, Salesforce performance. Um, I want to share my thoughts on the business problem because every, below every solution we have, there has to be a business problem on my Salesforce is so slow. Afterwards, I will explain on a theoretical level first, the difference between the traditional implementation on the one hand and the event-driven or platform event way of doing it on the other hand. Then I will try my hands on a live implementation. Oh, wish me luck, live implementation. It's always, I, I exercised it so many times, but hopefully everything works as expected. And after live in, um, implementation, after the demo, I will show, um, I share my pros and cons. Everything I'm talking about today, don't take it from an expert. I'm not an uh, uh, event-driven, architecture expert at all. I just want to share my thoughts on using event, platform events over the last one or two years. What is my experiences? Um, what do I like about them? What do I don't I like about it? But try it yourself. Become an expert yourself, as always in our community. Anyways, after I shared the pros and cons, a few things, what to look out for, when to implement it, and that's it. It should take about, about 30 minutes as normally, give or take two or three minutes. So before we get started, as always, who am I? I'm Johan from Berlin. Some of you know me. Um, I'm currently in a sabbatical, so that means I don't work. Um, I started out about six years ago as an admin, then had a brief intermezzo as a developer slash technical architect or technical product owner, and I'm currently an architect in the making. I'm looking forward to get in contact with you either through email or through Twitter. You see my contact details here. Um, since it all will be up on YouTube, you can pause here. And one of my favorite things to do in, the Salesforce, in my Salesforce orgs I'm responsible for is remove, remove, remove. So the question always is, do we really need that feature? And this will also be one of the answers for our business problem, remove. Okay. The business problem is my Salesforce is slow. 
we all know that complaint. We all heard it, and I'm pretty sure we all ignored it. I ignored it for most of my career. Users constantly complain, and I have to be honest, Salesforce is slow, especially in our modern day of age. Uh, uh, modern day. Okay. Imagine you have a smartphone app which behaves as slacky, as slow as Salesforce does, where every time you click save, it takes three to five seconds. Where every time you open a page, it takes one to three seconds. Imagine that. You would never accept that. You would de uninstall the app immediately and give it zero stars. But in the Salesforce world, when our users come to us and complain, my Salesforce is slow, we say, what are we going to do about it? We cannot change anything anyway. We cannot add more CPU. We cannot add more RAM. We can just tell the user, come on, it's a CRM system. What do you care? It's not a first-person shooter where every millisecond counts. Users have to use it anyways. So why is this the wrong approach? Speed matters out of two reasons. First, employee productivity. If you can increase the saving speed of a button click, of a save button click by four seconds, and our users are using it, this button 10 times an hour and using it eight hours a day, you improve the performance by 1%, employee productivity by 1%. Imagine you ask your CEO if he's fine by decreasing the employee productivity by 1% across the board. Never. But for some reason, we get away with a slow sales force. Or we never put effort into making Salesforce faster. We put in a lot of effort for small automations, for small optimizations, for a pre-filled value here, an automated created task there, an automated um, calculated star rating there. But we never put in effort into performance and employee productivity. And the second thing is I find more important employee happiness and therefore Salesforce user adoption. When every update in Salesforce takes multiple seconds, one, three, five seconds, users will not put in all the data they get from the customers. You get some information about a hobby, about a detail which might be important later on a phone call, in an email from the customer. If you know already it will take you 10 to 15 seconds altogether, maybe 30 seconds, to put the data into Salesforce, and you don't get the value yet, are you going to do it? Very likely not. Yes, there are a few super motivated professional salespeople. They understand the value of data, but most of them will not put it into Salesforce because it's slow. It feels sluggish. And employees who don't like your Salesforce, who are not happy about your Salesforce, might even switch to a different employer which has a faster system. So making Salesforce faster will not make your salespeople or your Salesforce users happy, but it will make them less happy or less unhappy and therefore put more data into Salesforce and therefore improve your data process quality, your data quality. So speed should be at the core of your business problems you want to solve with your Salesforce implementation. It should be over are the days where we don't care about speed, where we can't do anything anyways. Especially since we move to Lightning, speed becomes more and more important and you can do more and more with speed. So there are two, two steps you can do in order to improve speed. Of course, platform events. Platform events are amazing and I will share my thoughts on how to improve the speed of Salesforce a lot by platform events. But before you start with platform events, there's one step I want to encourage you all to do. Remove, remove, remove. Everything you remove from your system, every, plot, every process builder, every trigger, every workflow rule, every validation rule, every field, every formula field, every roll-up summary, every sharing rule, everything re you remove from your system makes your system faster especially the highly used objects, I guess lead, opportunity, or stuff like that. Focus on them and make it faster Rem by removing implement uh, stuff, by removing workflows. Okay, how to remove? You should have a budget for refactoring anyway. 
10 to 20% of your resources should be constantly for refactoring. And refactoring not only means make code better, but also remove stuff of your system. So, so please go forward, ask your CEO, ask your CTO for a budget to constantly remove features from your system. But once you cleaned up your system, once you removed everything, we can move over to platform events. And platform events make your system faster by decoupling processes. They can make your system, your safe update, as your up, uh, create, update, and delete faster by up to 90%, usually around 50 to 70% by decoupling processes. So before I explain decoupling processes, I want to explain the traditional way of implementing. And therefore, I use an example. We all have an, in our systems. An opportunity is set to closed and lost. Therefore, a task is created for the opportunity owner. Simplest example, there is a myriad ways of implementing it. Process builder, trigger, workflow, uh, process builder and flow, trigger, trigger and flow, um, quick action, lightning component, lightning web component, visual force page, whatever. I will use the process builder example. Process builder creates a task. And first, traditional implementation. The coupled or the slow implementation. This is what we all know. Everything is done within the same transaction. We have an opportunity update. Once this is finished, we have a task creation. Once this is finished, the page is refreshed. Everything in the same transaction. If one thing of the whole chain breaks, for example, the task creation, everything is rolled back, and the user has displayed an error message. If everything runs smoothly, after the page refresh, the user has given back control with a success message, 180 milliseconds. The milliseconds I quote are for a completely empty developer work. 180 milliseconds when, and, when I tested. 21, 22, 23. For this simple example, many other operations take way longer than that. Okay. This is the coupled, slow, or the traditional way of implementing. Good news? We all know that we all have done that, tried and tested. Now, the new way of doing it, using platform events, decoupled and fast. Once the opportunity update is done, and a platform event is fired, the platform event then triggers two things. On the one hand, the page refresh. The page refresh is done and the user gets control after 77 milliseconds in my test. This is 60% faster than the other way of implementing from a user point of view. And for me personally, when I talk about speed, only the user point of view matters. Only what the user experiences is really important. And the second thing what happens is once the platform event is fired, the task is created, but the task is created independently from the opportunity update. Therefore, the user does not have to wait until the task is created. And this makes it faster. This is what we call decoupled. Decoupled has the advantage the user doesn't have to wait. It also has the disadvantage that when the page is refreshed, the task is actually not created yet. Therefore, the user might have to wait one or two seconds and then manually refresh in order to see the task. But besides, usually users don't actually care about the task. They just want to update the opportunity. They want to set the opportunity to closed and lost. Yes, it's important that the task is there eventually. This is called um, eventual, oh, I forgot the word. The task is there eventually, and the task is there when the user needs it, but the task is not there after the page refresh. The same is true for error and success messages. The task creation that will not display any error or success messages to the user because it's decoupled. It's done in a separate transaction. And the separate transaction has one more advantage. It has a different set of limits. So therefore, it's done with a new limit a CPU timeout, with a new limit for um, SQL queries and so forth. So you get a, a fresh slate after the platform event. And you can have, this is the last important thing, as many um, listeners or subscribers to the platform event as you want. 
the platform event doesn't care. And this already, I, I can't explain event-driven architecture in too much detail here. We only have 30 minutes and I'm not that good in explaining stuff like that. But let me try to share an example. I am the publisher. I'm in a room, in a dark room. And I share, I shout into the room, hello. Hello is the event. Hello, I'm here. This is the event. Okay. There might be zero people in the room listening. There might be 100 people in the room listening. I, as a publisher, don't know. And I will not get feedback from the subscribers, the listeners. Did they receive it? So they might have received it. They might not have received it. Um, this is the publisher subscriber model. It's decoupled. And I don't have to wait. I come into the room, say, hello, I'm here. And then I can continue to work immediately. I don't have to wait until everybody is done with what they want to do with that information. And this is the advantage. So what do I need to implement it as an admin? Do I need magic? No. Do I need code? No. Is it complicated? Slightly more complicated. Once you have done it two or three times, you will be super happy with it. I need three elements. I need the platform event object itself, which is the bearer of my message. And then I need a publisher. This is the first process builder, which creates the platform event. And I need a subscriber. This is the second process builder, which executes the business action up on receiving the event. So what is the platform event? Is this an object? Kind of. It looks a lot like a normal object. It has custom fields, it has triggers, you can have process builder on top of a platform event. But at the same time, it's not a normal object. It doesn't have a page layout, it doesn't have workflow rules, it doesn't have validation rules. It's not stored in the database, it's created and immediately deleted. It's, it's in a different way. You cannot report on it, you cannot update it. You only have one chance you cannot, um, you create it, then somebody can listen to it. I mean, there's the replay idea, different topic, but, and then that's it. And you don't care how many people listen to it. It's great, and you can um, consume it internally within Salesforce or externally, outside of Salesforce. And then you use this platform event to publish and subscribe. So, so I wanna, do this now together with you. I want to implement a live demo. And for the live demo, I prepared a little bit of a different example. When the contact last name is changed, a task must be created for the account owner. Changed last name. The task is due in seven days. Again, simple example. We all have done it together many times. So I have to do three steps. I have to create a platform event object, contact PE, with two fields, event and record ID. Event is what happened, the last name changed, and record ID, on which record did it happen? Because the event itself is agnostic. Then the second one is I have to create a publisher, so I fire a platform event from contact process builder. And the third one is create a task from the contact PE process builder. subscriber. So wish me luck. I go over now into my developer org. Good. So in setup, oh, no. in setup, I search for platform event and go here, new platform event. You have to have one platform event per object you want to use. You can have multiple ob uh, platform, object, uh, platform events per object, but you need at least one per object. You cannot use the same platform event for opportunity and account. You will see later why. So I will contact, contact PE. Contact PEs and publish after commit. This is very important and deploy, done. Then you see here, it looks a lot like a custom object. It has custom fields and relationships. Fun fact here, it doesn't actually have relationships. Maybe sense was fix it at, at some point. So I click new here. 
I say text, event, save, and again text and record ID and always require a field you save the record. Nice. Done. So I created now the platform event itself, the object. Now we have to go and create the publisher. I will create a new process builder on contact object, but you also could do that on your existing contact process builder. If you already have one, you can do it from a trigger. Um, you can create it from a lightning component, whatever you want. So I can't. Uh, contact PB, process builder. And when a record changes, we all have done this 1 million times. Object is contact. Record is edited. Last name changed. And save. What, so we have defined the criteria and now we publish the platform event. So we say create record. As I told you, it's very similar to um, uh, PE and we call it contact PE event, last name changed and record ID field reference because we want to pass it the ID of the record which was changed. You can actually pass whatever you want. No, just do the record ID and save. Activate. Oh, by the way, and we created our publisher. Now all it's miss, uh, missing is the subscriber. So again, I do new, um, I say, a platform event message that's received. We can contact PE. Then we say for a platform event contact PE and which object contact. The good news is we will not only have all the fields available which are on the platform event itself, but we will also find have all the fields on the contact available. This is why we gave it the record ID. Salesforce looks up the corresponding contact equals event reference record ID. And now uh, gives us in the process builder access to all the fields on the contact, which is amazing. So I will say last name changed. Platform event, I say which, what happens, event, I always copy paste this one because so many times I try, um, I made a mistake here. Click save. So now we subscribe to this platform event and say, hey, whenever you receive a contact PE where the event is last name changed, please, what should we do? Create a task. Create a record, task, task, oops. Assign to field reference. As you see, we have access to all the contact fields now. Account ID, owner. Priority normal, status not started. Um, then subject. Um, changed last name. Do it only formula. Um, and last one is name. Oops. Name ID. We can, this time we can even do event reference, so we can also access the fields from the event, the record ID. Save. And activate. So that's it. We also created our subscriber. So some, I want to summarize it. 
we had to create three elements, a platform event object, a, then a publisher, which creates the file as a platform event from the contact process builder, and a subscriber, which creates the task from the contact PE process builder. So let's test it. Are you nervous with me? Yes, I am. So one last refresh here. No task is present, you know. And I say, Maya, I changed the last name, Mayas. It was super quick, wasn't it? But no task is here. Why? As I told you before, when the page refresh happened, the task was actually not created yet. When I click refresh, here is my task. Aren't you amazed? I am every time. I'm <laughs> happy every time this happens. So but this brings me already to the sec first con. The results are not immediately available. The user had to manually refresh. As I told you, most of the times, the user don't actually care. Then, downstream error messages are not displayed. So let's imagine the task was not created, the error message is not displayed. So user is not informed about it. A little bit more planning is needed and the time to implement is two or three times longer. But once you have done it a couple of times, it's super quick. And last thing is it's harder to debug. Since you have now three different moving parts, um, before you had only one, it's way harder to debug. I can tell you, chatter posts are your best friend. I use chatter posts all the time. Okay, did my process build actually fire? Good. But pro, it's also downstream error messages are not displayed. I think we should, we should not show our users downstream error messages. We, as a Salesforce team, we, the admins and developers, should handle them gracefully in the background. There should be not error messages shown to the user, especially cryptic ones. What is the user going to do about it? Um, panic, ignore them, create a case, I don't know. But nothing out of value for the company. We should handle that. And lastly, this is important, it's 50 to 90% faster. It's so much more faster. You always should do it. This is my when to implement asynchronous. Since it's so much faster, it should be your default, unless the user has to see the results immediately. You should always use platform events. It's, it's a no-brainer. Examples are, you create update or delete related records, tasks, emails, opportunities, quote that item, whatever. User usually doesn't care. I'd say the, every time an opportunity is closed and one, a new project object, a record should be created. Does the user care about the new project object? No. Slow, slow calculations on the same record. And let me tell you, every calculation which is based on other records, also an, an other record, which has to do a database round trip, is slow, very likely a good, candidate for platform events. As I told you, you can also use platform events on triggers, but, um, but it's usually harder to convince developers to use platform events for some reason. And callouts to other system. This is, of course, I mean, a callout to another system is always super slow because the other system, you know, call, blah, 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 back and forth. So it should be your default. And once, you got a little bit of experiences, it will be your default, but you have to teach your colleagues, you have to spread the word, you have to start using them, see nothing bad comes out of it. I can tell you after, after using them for quite a while, after implementing hundreds of them, um, firing millions of platform events, they are super stable. Every time we thought platform events are buggy, it was one of our implementation was bad. It was never the platform itself, technology itself. Debugging can be hard. This is why we thought sometimes it's buggy, but it actually never was because since you have like two points which can break, debugging is slightly more complicated, especially when you have chained events, you have multiple platform events. Always select after commit. It's a default anyways, but just keep that in mind. And yes, train your colleagues. Very important. You cannot do that alone. When somebody else sees that, they will not understand what you did there. It will be, okay, a platform event was fired. What does this mean? Where is the listener? You have 
to make an informed architecture decision within your team, within your Salesforce org, how to use platform events, how to go forward. It's too new, it's too unknown to just make it on your own. You have to share the knowledge. And that already concludes my session. Thank you very much for being able to, for joining me on this session today. Thanks a lot. I'm super happy I could share my enthusiasm about platform events. Please share your fails and your successes with platform events in the next weeks or months on Twitter with me. All questions and feedbacks I have, I will be available on Twitter today. Um, I'm looking forward to see um, many other sessions from many other people. Thanks a lot. Stay safe, stay at home, um, and have fun. See you. Bye. <laughs>